Welcome everyone to Expanding Your Consciousness. This is September 20th, 2022. And this week we continue with intentional healing. Last week we were looking at some videos of Lynn McTaggart who wrote The Field. And she also uh, wrote a book called The Intentional Experiment. And she has a website on that too, where people come together and they send intentional healing to different people. And so uh, we decided to do that last week. We sent healing to Brent, who is with our meetup group and he had surgery a few weeks ago. And so he's recovering from that. And we're hoping he joins us next week. And I did not tell him beforehand that we were going to send some healing to him. But I did follow up after our meeting and I did email him and ask if he felt anything. And so I'm just going to read his response. I'll read what I wrote to him and then what he replied. So I said, hi, Brent. We are wondering how you're feeling. We did a group healing last Tuesday for you. I will post the video tomorrow. We were wondering if you could feel anything. There were four of us participating. He said, thanks, Diane. I appreciate the thought. I can't really say that I felt anything special in particular that day. What really seems to be happening is I'm slowly recovering and will probably be back to normal in the next week or so. I would imagine, but it's more like a little bit every day than any kind of particular burst of change, so to speak. And then, you know, he just goes on that he'll probably join us next week. But he did uh, tell everyone thanks for their positive focus on my situation. So what I thought we'd do tonight is just continue with intentional healing, but also just looking at the whole idea of, of sending intentional thoughts out there. And so I've selected some videos of Limit Taggart. Actually, it's one talk she did but she broke it up into about five pieces. I don't know if we'll have a chance to look at all five, but I'd like to look at at least the first three. And so with the first one, she looks at negative intention. And I'd like us to at least watch it. It's about 10 minutes long and then discuss it afterwards. There probably isn't a person that doesn't at some point ask me about negative intention. So our first session this afternoon is going to tackle the unmentionable. We all want to know how to stop thinking bad thoughts. If we're all leaky buckets, how do we stop sending out negative intention? And if we are leaky buckets receiving all the time and everybody else is a leaky bucket, how do we stop ourselves from receiving negative energy? So we're going to address that with a few, but I want you to think about a couple of concepts. First of all, the very simple concept that most negative intention is inside you. What you're receiving, most of what you think you're receiving is oftentimes your take on the situation. And also, most of us walk around in judgment. Walk in, most of us walk around with negative thoughts streaming through our heads. How many people in the audience think happy thoughts most of the time? Hands. More than usual, that's very good. Excellent. But as you noticed, the vast majority did not raise their hand because we all spend our time looking at the glass being half full. We all spend our time Judging, it's a little internal monologue that goes something like, look how you muffed that one, you know, or my kid is really bad at math. I wonder what I should do about it. Um, that person doesn't like me. And on and on it goes, that internal monologue of negative thinking. So one of the first things you have to do is start becoming conscious of what it is that you're thinking. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that you turn off thought that will be almost impossible. It's been suggested in many quarters, but we're human. We were given cognitive thinking as a blessing or a curse, and it is both at different times. But it's more about just stepping one step back to start observing what it is you're thinking. A very simple thing to do is just 
to start writing it down. Just take one day and write down what you think, what you think. Every time you have a thought, write it down in a little journal and then look at it at the end of the day and weigh it. You could even do it in two columns, one positive, one negative. Look at what you're thinking and see how it ends up stacking. Most, if you're like most people, it's 80% negative and about 20% positive. And particularly keep a separate column for what you think about yourself. And note that there's almost never a time where you give yourself applause. There's almost never a time that you think anything at all. If you do po something positive, you usually don't think about it. If you do something, you don't think, boy, I did a good job there. You look, wait for somebody else to tell you that. But ordinarily, you only start thinking about yourself when it's something you don't like. I look too fat in that dress. I got a really low grade. I can't stand the way I talk to people. I'm so shy. And on and on and on. The thoughts you, you reserve for yourself are the worst thoughts you usually have. So just start becoming aware of that and start noting it down. What I'm trying to get you to is to start becoming aware of what it is you're really sending most of the time. Remember, if you're a leaky bucket, you're sending intention with every thought you have. And what you have to do is start looking at what it is you're sending and weigh it up as positive or negative. The other thing I want you to think about is to be careful what you wish for. You know, we talked about being specific yesterday. This is a picture of Heather Mills McCartney, now Heather Mills. And I put it up because Heather Mills wanted more than anything else to be famous. This consumed her as a young person. She was desperate to be famous. And in that process and that intention, she married one of the most famous people in the world. And as a result of that, the press got hold of her and dug up every last skeleton in her closet. And there were many. I mean, she had a background that she had done pornography. She was a prostitute. She had all sorts of things. And now she is one of the most infamous women in England. She's famous all right, but famous for all the wrong things. So I'm suggesting that you be responsible for your thoughts and what you want and, carry, and start thinking about what it would mean. What's the nth degree? If, and I don't have a value judgment on this, if your real intention is to be wealthy, seriously wealthy, you must think, what are the implications of that? Can I manage that wealth? Can I manage those things? Am I OK with all those things? You know, what am I going to do with my wealth? Um, that will take extra time. Or if I want to be married, you know, are you ready to be married? Can you handle the responsibility of marriage? Or I want a, I want a child. <coughs> You know, are you ready to step outside the center of your own life? That's what it's going to take to be a parent. So those kinds of questions are things you must ask yourself. And this is part and parcel of the whole idea of identifying what it is you really want. Well, Heather Mills did not want to be infamous, but she just sent out an intention to the world to be famous. And she surely is. She's on every cover of OK and, and Hello magazine. But it's all the wrong publicity. So be careful and specific about what it is you want. I put up the fact that we all use murderous thoughts because we do routinely for illness. Cancer patients have been told to use intention to kill the cancer. Now that's murder. And I have looked and looked at the data on intention, hoping to be able to say to people like you, you know, happy thoughts, positive thoughts, they're more powerful than negative thoughts. But it's not true. The data that's out there, the science that's out there, demonstrates that a negative thought is just as powerful as a positive thought. There have been studies, and many of them, of intention masters, like Qigong masters, sending intention to inhibit a plant or make it grow. And they've used positive and alternating positive and negative intention, sending positive intention to make something grow, sending, then sending negative intention to inhibit it. And they found they have an equal effect. They can stop a plant growing with their thoughts. 
that can make a plant grow faster with their thoughts. Um, many studies, remember you can't really use studies to try to murder people, you know, it's probably going to go through, go against a few ethical reviews. Um, you know, sometimes we wouldn't know about that in terms of drug trials, you'd think, you know, you think that seems to be a license to get away with murder. But in most cases, we obviously can't send negative intention to people. So what they tend to do with these studies is use bacteria or fungi or something that people don't mind sending murderous thoughts to. And they found that ordinary people can send intention to inhibit bacteria or inhibit fungi or inhibit things like E. coli, you know, which is, a, uh, you know, which is alternately a blessing and a curse to the human system. And they found they can inhibit it if they want to. So I was interested in this, and I wondered, what's more powerful, sending a negative intention for cancer or what? And there's been one very interesting study about this. It was with a healer who felt uncomfortable about sending negative intention. He felt, if I send negative intention to the cancer, I might miss. My aim might be off that day, and I'll actually hit and kill the host. So he was in the study using five different methods of trying to kill cancer cells. In one, he was supposed to send intention to kill them. Another was to send them into the void. Another was to one other kind of murderous thought. And then he had two that were just, to, one was to carry out God's will, and the other was to return things to the natural order of perfect health. He did that intention, and it turned out to the, be the most powerful. The returning it to natural order and perfect health. Now, the even more powerful one was when he concentrated very specifically on certain cancer cells. So he combined being specific with sending an intention to, come ch to return to the natural order. Now, this is only one study. It's hard to make any generalizations about it. But this is what I come up with from that. I think that might be all about sending a specific intention, but turning it around in a positive way. So instead of saying, I want to kill cancer cells, we ch or, and visualizing them dying, and that's what lots of the uh, cancer alternative pioneers talked about. They did a lot of visualization of imagining cancer cells in a kind of battle with your healthy cells, or even imagining the cancer cells being eaten up by a video game like Pac-Man, you know? Those are all kind of negative intentions in a sense. But I think perhaps the more powerful thought is a positive intention of imagining all of your healthy cells, or all of your cancer cells transmuting into healthy cells, or this healthy cells kind of taking rain, or something where you're returning to the natural order. So I hope that's clear, the idea of being very specific, but turning it around in a positive way. Okay, so any comments, Cody? I have one comment, and uh, so I do cancer healing, and um, I've learned about death energy, and I don't consider death energy to be negative and healing energy to be positive. There's no need for us to plunk them into those labels, put those labels on them. Death energy kills things, and that is neither good nor bad, depending on their point of view. If you were the mouse getting killed by the cat, that's bad. But if you're the cat and you're hungry, then it's good. So to say this is positive and that's negative just makes things complicated. Does it work or does it not work? And that's... If you're trying to cure cancer, then lumping them all, labeling this positive and that negative. So from the point of view of the patient, killing the cancer cells is a very positive thing. There's nothing negative about it at all. Let's get rid of that poisonous thing in my body. So that was the first thing. I don't like her way of categorizing healing as, or this energy as either positive or negative. There is life-giving energy and there's death-giving energy. But if you had COVID-19 and they tell you you're full of all these viruses, let's kill them. That's the good thing to do. Now, if you're a virus, I don't know what it's like to be a virus, but I don't imagine it's too good to be killed. 
but is it not a person's state of mind? Because yes, you may say, oh, I want to kill that cancer, but there are quite a few patients, I shouldn't say quite a few, but there are people where that cancer keeps coming back. But if you focus on the healing aspect, the um, healthy cells and expanding the healthy cells, it'd be interesting to know if that actually helps with the cancer like with those people taking that approach if they actually have cancer ever coming back yeah it's, it's see that's the correct way to do it is to say i wonder what would happen if and yeah. then go and do the experiment and if there's no experiment done well probably we can't come to much of a conclusion yeah and i mean we do live in a society that i feel uh, very much focuses us on fear and death and fear of death, right? Okay. And so I think even with someone with cancer, that is kind of programmed in that it's, oh, it's, it is negative. It's a bad thing. And I don't know if I can, if I'm strong enough to fight something so powerful as that awful thing called cancer, but taking a more positive, uplifting type of approach. Like I remember uh, a woman I worked with, a young woman actually, she was probably in her 20s at the time, and she had uh, bone cancer in the shoulder. And one technique that her doctor used is he said, I want you to just focus on happy thoughts, like, you know, your happy place when you're going through all the, I think she went through chemo or uh, radiation, maybe in that place. And so he very much focused on the positive side of things with her. Well, that's the patient's thoughts. Yes. So that's different than the healer's thoughts. So the healer, for him or her, it's about curing the patient of cancer, getting rid of their cancer. Now, if the a patient has fear, that doesn't help getting rid of the cancer. That has the opposite effect. So the patient's mind is a whole different thing. There's positive and negative there. There's a thought process and an attitude that will get rid of cancer and another one that will just make it grow faster. So, and, and we could, you know, I've heard people laugh and that helps them. Uh, I've met people who have lived for several years longer than the doctor predicted because they changed their lifestyle and did all kinds of things. So it does happen and, and the patient's attitude is really important, but I think to categorize the healer as something positive or negative, I'm telling you, it's all positive because if you get rid of that tumor, you have just done a great deed for someone. Nothing wrong with killing, this. if there's nothing negative about killing cancer or COVID-19 or any of these things, they're the enemy. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Cody. That's an uh, important distinction uh, between uh, the uh, person sending out the healing and the thoughts of the, you know, the patient. So if, um, like she says, you want to be very clear and precise about what energy or thoughts you're sending yourself. And uh, somebody who is, you know, remotely sending energy to somebody they're just, yeah, they're just sending that intention and that energy for a positive result. And uh, however it happens, it's uh, hopefully it's a, a positive result and a good outcome. So yeah, I think that was the, the thing I picked up on as well, that it was the thoughts of the patient and the, just how their, what their relationship is with this technique, you know, or this possibility, yeah. I also want to go to other things she talked about, and that is we are these leaky buckets with our thinking. Like we can be very sloppy with our thoughts, I would say, right? You know, uh, some of us, maybe not everyone. Uh, and she talks about even taking a day to write down some of those thoughts and, you know, positive, negative, and also like of others, but also about ourselves. What do you think of that approach? I think it's brilliant. The, uh, in Buddhism, they call it mindfulness. That is, you pay attention to your thoughts. And when you do that, it's just like she says, you think, well, why am I thinking this? Oh, and what happens is then you, if you want to think 
beneficial thoughts, thoughts that lead to healing and a happy life, then you better stop thinking all those ones that lead to sickness and, and a miserable life. So there's two goals. One is stopping the negative thoughts. And in that case, it's the person killing themselves or undermining their own health. And you want to have more of the positive healing type thoughts. So from the point of view of the person who's just you and me and ourself, then we can divide the world into thoughts that lead that are healing and thoughts that make us sick and call it positive or negative if you like. But uh, that's really important. Yes. I kind of wrote down, we live in a society that is critical, yeah. right? Because she says, oh, we judge people critical. But if you look at society, it's about criticizing things, right? Yeah, yeah. We criticize a movie. We criticize a book. We we criticize the way a person dresses. We uh, we criticize how people may have a different view from us. I just feel that that is the challenge of separating ourselves. Do we have our own thoughts, or are these thoughts that are programmed in us? Right? Yeah. Oh. And television, I think, is crucial to be aware of. You know, it's, people say, oh, be careful of your thoughts. But how many of those people sit there and watch television with commercials that say, oh, you smell bad. Oh, get something for your breath. Uh, this yeah. and that, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, they have some goofy character that's un unattractive in some way, right? And that's planted in our mind, right? You know, or this is what a smart person looks like, this is what a sexy woman looks like, or whatever, right? So I, you know, I think that is something to be aware of as well. Um, and also the thing about the, uh, I guess, the former wife of Paul McCartney she was talking about, uh, that was interesting. Be careful what you ask for, right? I thought was very insightful because often we do uh, you know, we live in a society that uh, programs us to think we have to have more, more of this, more of that. And when you get it, also you want the next more, right? <laughs> you know? So, right. It, it is, you know, on this treadmill all the time of wanting more. And it comes. Well, that, that's part of the stating your intentions very clearly. So, so I want to be famous and want to be famous and she became famous but also infamous and all of her skeletons were revealed. Diane and our, myself, our friend Janice and Hamilton, she ran a courses in Reiki and she did a lot of healing. She probably still does. Um, and she talked about one of her friends who asked, she says, I, I want to be strong. I want to be strong. Like, I, I need this inner strength. I need to be a strong person, not physically, but just. A, so she continually had all these uh, things uh, that came into her life that she had to overcome. And they were just horrible trials. And they made her stronger, but she had to go through hell. <laughs> you know, it, because she just I kept asking for strength, for strength. Well, how do you become strong? Well, you have to. You have to exercise. You have to have something that you to you know get you strong, like lifting yeah, weights or whatever. It's just we have to lift these uh, trials and tribulations. And she says, "So be careful <laughs> what you ask for." Right? So, yeah, that's a that's a good one. Yeah. So uh, part two is about competition, and she says competition is negative and can harm others. And she also looks at the impact that our energy field has on machines too. So uh, this would be an interesting one to uh, listen to. Now, this is another thing I want to, we don't have time to talk about business and I'd like to do that as a whole separate workshop. And we were just talking about that at lunch break um, because we've done sections of, of living the field just on work in the field and it's a whole other issue. But I want you to just keep this in mind when you're looking at your life in relation to everything else and looking at negative intention. Competition is negative intention. Now, we don't think of that. We foster competition. 
And, you know, and I've got a very sporty younger kid, and I'm oftentimes there at her matches going, yes, go! And because I'm, you know, American, you know, we've got all these very polite um, English people kind of quietly cheering, and I'm there being the loudest mom in the, you know, in the sidelines there, um, yelling and screaming for Anya. Um, but I think about that, and I come away and I think, well, okay, how do we now tell our kids, this is just a game. This is what you shouldn't be doing in real life. And I think that this is something we should just stop long enough to think about. Because competition permeates every bone of our body. And remember, competition is I win at somebody else's expense. It is about my significance at the expense of someone else. And I just want you to think about things in another way, which is it is possible perfectly possible to run your business, to work in your job, and not be competitive. You don't have to watch and note, make mental noting about how other people fail, because that isn't going to make you any more significant than you are already. And if we're all connected, if they fail, you fail. You don't have to run your business to beat out all your competitors. I've been interested in collecting stories of people where everybody gets ahead by sharing data. You know, it's possible to go out there and be cooperative. I hope I gave you a little glimpse of that. The animal kingdom is very interesting because there's very little gratuitous killing. You know, there's very little gratuitous killing. People talk about, oh, no, no, it's all about competition and only the strongest survive. Not true. An animal eats because it needs to. An animal doesn't kill gratuitously. We're the only animal on Earth that kills gratuitously. And so in that sense, we are the most competitive of all. It's not mirrored in the animal, in the animal model. So step back for a moment. You don't have to teach your children about being significant by being an individual at other people's expense. That is a negative intention because in a sense, you are saying, I win, you lose. Now, I put this up as one of the awfulest, ugliest pictures I can think of of myself because I want to illustrate things that happened to me, in a sense, by accident. I heard of somebody else. Wasn't there somebody in the audience talking about their force field and how they, they broke things? Didn't somebody say that in the audience? Yes. You, don't you have an, do you have an effect on equipment, is it? You have an effect on equipment. So do I. So do I. But I'll tell you about that in a minute. I also seem to have, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that I might have an effect on people when I'm in a bad mood, too. Brian and I, nine years ago, moved into a house in, in uh, southeast Lond uh, southwest London. And we, we got an Art Deco house. And it was a wreck when we got it. And we decided to take on the project of renovating this. And we thought, well, we both love Art Deco, so we'll make it Art Deco. So I spent a lot of time and we spent a lot of hard-earned cash putting this house back together. And we had just moved in three weeks later. And I had a very sweet cleaner who was very over-enthusiastic with the scale removal. And as you know, if you're not from England, you may not know this, but for anyone in England, we have very hard water here. So she's scrubbing along and I get back from work and I see that she has accidentally scrubbed off all the chrome and all the brand new taps in the house. So I die a quiet death. I go to my bed. I freak out. I don't know how to discharge my anger. She's already gone home. And I scream and yell and I hit some pillows. And I learn the next week that at about the time I was doing that, she fell off the bus and broke her leg. So I wondered to myself, did I do that? And I had a similar experience some months later. As you know, if you're from England, everything in our banks is controlled by direct debits and by computer. And one month, Brian and I noticed that all of our checks, all of our direct debits were bouncing. Our mortgage payment was bouncing. Everything was bouncing. And we were freaking out, thinking, this shouldn't be. And so we found, to our horror, that the bank didn't register one of our paychecks. And I was so angry about this because I know even with that kind of mistake, it affects your credit rating and this and that, et cetera, et cetera. Mortgages, lenders aren't very patient about such things. 
So I was irrationally angry and just had to be angry at something or someone. So I directed all my anger at my bank manager. Now, she had nothing to do with this. She's a lovely lady. But to my horror, the next week, I found that just about the time I was venting my spleen, she fell on the pavement and broke all of her front teeth. And I started thinking to myself, by this time I'm getting very paranoid, and I'm thinking, don't have a bad mood, you know, and you know, God knows what you're going to do to the teen. So I have no idea if I'm affecting people or not. These could have been strange coincidences. I don't know. But I only put this up to say, if we are leaky buckets, and notice, even in our little practice sessions, when you were sending and receiving, people were picking up changes of thoughts. One of the people in our audience, Aransu, told me that her partner sent her red heart and then changed his mind and sent her sword. Now, the initial thing was she picked up red heart. She picked up the original, the original message, and then she got us changed. And she came up with sword, which actually is shaped like a heart, too, I mean, like a flower, too. Or no, it was sword. It was flower, and you picked up sword. So that was a bit like a flower. So she was picking up his changes of information almost in real time. And that happens a lot. We hear this a great deal from people doing this kind of experiment. So your unintentional intentions are not locked inside your head. Your anger and frustration at people are not locked inside your head. They're beaming out, and they are affecting people around you at every moment. So this is just, again, a caution to be aware of them, to step back one step and be aware of them. And besides people, to consider everything else around you. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are angels and there are gremlins. And this is actually, scientists talk about this. It's a well-established fact that some people have a positive effect on equipment and some people a negative effect. There was a scientist, dear scientist, called Jacques Bendeniste, who has done the work on memory of water. And he found really interesting material that molecules all have a unique resonance, their own unique sound, if you will. And if you play that sound to another molecule, without having the original molecule present, you can affect a chemical reaction. Just the frequency can cause the reaction. So he wanted to convince the orthodoxy of this. So he decided to remove humans from the experiment and just have a robot doing this. And the robot had an arm where it would kind of swing over and mix the material and get the, a little coil with the sound of a molecule and play it and just do this whole, whole kind of experiment without humans. And he found his robot worked perfectly, except in the presence of one woman. Now, Ben Benista was the most charming Frenchman, and he was a terrible chauvinist. In fact, and he was very funny, too, because I met him during the time of the Monica Lewinsky scandal in America with President Clinton. And he turned to me and said, we French, we can't understand this. Our president would be impeached if he didn't have a mistress. <laughs> so, so I loved that story. So he said to himself, thinking this woman is the cause of all of this, Cherchez la femme, you know, look to the woman. Um, and that, of course, it's going to be a woman, as he said. So he thought to himself, well, hmm, there's something about her force field that's ruining this, this machine. So who would the machine love? And he thought, well, the machine's probably going to love its inventor. So he brings the inventor to the machine, and the machine starts working again. So he thinks, well, I can't have the, machine, the inventor around. The machine's happy, so I'll put an electromagnetic shield around it and, and shield it from this woman. And when he did, the machine would stop working altogether. So then he thought, hmm, this is probably going to be a little bit like witchcraft, but I'll give my, the inventor a little vial of water to hold for two hours. So he does that. He takes the vial of water, he sticks it inside the electromagnetic shield, and from then on, the machine works perfectly. So just as there are enhancers of equipment, there are also detractors. I am a gremlin of the first order. I have a terrifically bad effect on equipment. Friday, 
My staff was in stitches because I did something and I, er, I practically erased my entire hard drive. It suddenly, just everything on my desktop just suddenly disappeared. If I'm in an agitated mood, which is only occasionally, I start breaking every piece of equipment in our office. I break computers and then there was one time I was really agitated. I broke one computer. I went, ah. I went over to the another computer. I broke that. And then I went over to the photocopier to photocopy and that stopped working. And at that point, my staff started edging me toward the door. <laughs> so there are enhancers and attractors and I just want you to consider that when you are in a bad mood, you are sending out to your environment including your inanimate equipment. Um, we have so much evidence from the random event generator studies that you have a profound effect on electronic equipment. So just bear it in mind. Hello. Hi, well. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You there? Did you get to see much of that? So, and Faith, did you catch much of that? No, just the last two minutes, literally, so. Okay, all right. But no, I, I, I relate to that. But I noticed that I only have problems though during Mercury retrograde. There is something to that. Mercury retrograde affects electronics, communication, yeah, everything like, like that. And uh, in the first part of this one, she talked about um, how our thoughts, first of all, she talked about uh, competition is negative right? When we're competing with others, but because we are in the field of energy and that whole idea of, you know, someone wins and someone loses has a negative effect on others, but also on ourselves. Uh, she also said that we seem to be more competitive, like, you know, people, that sort of thing. Oh, she gave examples too. She started talking about when she gets frustrated or angry and she directs those negative thoughts towards someone. Uh, she had situations where that impacted on uh, a couple of people. One was a woman that had been a cleaner at her place. And uh, about a week after those negative thoughts she had, the woman fell and broke her ankle. And then she had another negative thought about a bank employee because there were some financial problems. It, it was just uh, an error in the system, but uh, she directed it against this employee and her thinking and uh, that employee uh, about a week afterwards fell and uh, broke her front teeth, that sort of thing, right? So she said, I have no evidence that my thoughts impacted, but when I find when they tell me about the time that it happened, it's around the time I had those thoughts. Okay. I mean, wow, that's a lot of responsibility though. I mean, you could really blame yourself for everybody in your life that has problems just because you're having yeah. you know, anger towards them. I mean, I don't, not sure if I agree with that. Like that's yeah. a little bit extreme. Like, so because I'm angry at somebody and they hurt themselves, uh, maybe it's on them. It has nothing to do with me. Well, I mean, that could be the case, but I will give you a story um, that made me think what she was thinking. Um, and this was several years ago with a family member. And I was upset about this family member uh, taking advantage of another relative, an elderly relative. And so I was obsessed. You know, I was really like, you know, real up about it. Okay. And it was you know, in an evening where I was, you know, I wasn't working. So, you know, I had that time to become obsessed about something. Right. And I met that relative four or five days later and she said, you know, oh, it's interesting that, you know, my husband and I had a weird incident happen the other night. We were in a room hanging pictures. And she said, at one point, you know, we turned to get other ones. And the ones that were up there flew off the wall and smashed down on the floor as if someone had picked them up and thrown them down. And when she told me that, you know, I was asking about, oh, when was that? You know, and it was right around the time that I was having those really negative thoughts. So, uh, you know, again, I can't prove it. But I do think, like she said, our thoughts can be like leaky buckets. And uh, we should be aware that our, our thoughts are not just in our mind, right? We are sending those thoughts out into an, the energy field. We are energy beings. Any comment? But you know, the thing is that um, 
it could be their karma too. It just, they brought it on themselves because they're doing bad things, <laughs> bad deeds. So, you know, there is a cause. I know you don't believe in karma, but there is a thing, cause and effect. I and believe in cause and effect. I do believe in it. And so the other thing too, is that I've been to this restaurant. Mm -hmm. I went there a few times over the last few weeks and no problem at all. You know, you can stay as long as you want, uh, you know, in, in the little booth, you know, a two seater booth with a plug to charge your computer. And this time I got a waitress or a server that was just really agitated. And then she took her agitation out on me and gave me a lecture and you know scolded me and i and i confronted her on it like yeah you don't that's not a good way to talk to customers you know like yeah. you're giving me a lecture like and scolding me and yeah, but, they, but were you sending out when you went in there right were you agitated before no, you it was the same as i was in the same space that i was in you know the last time before that last yeah. time before that yeah. it's just i guess they, they were just saying that it's really busy there it wasn't that busy but it was more busy than when I was there the last time. So actually, I think that's the reason. It's not because I was sending out some vibe. Okay. So I don't fully agree or with all of that, like, you know, I, maybe some partial truth, but I don't uh, subscribe to uh, taking responsibility for everybody's misery and all their accidents. Cause I, you know, that was put on me as a child. So, you know, like I was, I was, I was to blame for everybody's problems, you know? I was a scapegoat growing up as a little girl. You're gonna blame a little girl for yeah. other people's problems, yeah. right? I don't think so. I'm very resistant to this idea, totally. Anybody yeah. else have any comments on that? I have a comment on it. Okay. I thought it was totally brilliant. <laughs> I think she's making really good observations. And when she says she can't prove it, and, and then Di, when you say the same thing, Sorry, you are proving it. The, the, when you check out when did this happen and when did that happen, that's you investigating what really went on. And oh, well, it's just a coincidence. That's ir irresponsible. Yeah, when you notice yeah. these yeah. coincidences, then I don't know how you do a scientific experiment or anything, but these are coincidences actually happened. Yeah, so, uh, you're right. There are people that believe there's no such thing as a coincidence. Yeah, so the, um, we, we don't sometimes like to take responsibility for the negative things that we cause. But until we do, we're just going to keep causing negative things by being irresponsible. So no, the, negative, no the negative thing that I caused, if you want to look at it, that I was the cause, was that I wanted to stay longer and go to another booth and they weren't happy because uh but it was you know you have to acknowledge that some people are just bitchy and agitated and they're yes. just ready to take it out on somebody yes. that's going to push their button buttons or do something or say something that they don't like you know that that is the case here you know it was fine last week and this week is not okay like yeah. That's not totally on me. <laughs> That's only it's, because it's, it's not like when you were a kid and they put it totally on you because what they did was irresponsible. They blamed an innocent child for something they caused. So what I suggest you do is you not be like that. Don't fall into the same trap that your abusers did to you. That's not what I'm doing. Uh, what I'm doing. <laughs> <Good. Good. laughs> That's not what That's not what this is. What this is, is I was treat it in a very disrespectful okay not very disrespectful but it rude obnoxious and way by this server which is yeah. was completely unnecessary yeah, yeah. faith I, I do want to focus more like on the video and how our experiences relate to what she's talking about so the next part in that video she talks about how their energy field can have impact on equipment like computers copying machines, right? For the copying machines. So uh, I have a story about that. Uh, this was maybe several years ago. It was a conflict that I had with someone who we shared a laundry room, okay? And, <laughs> okay? And so uh, I was annoyed because she was interfering with something we were doing and gardening and that it was a silly actually it was a silly thing to get in a conflict over but at one point 
she she's doing laundry and the machine's running and she goes to the laundry room and she goes off Diane and slams the door and the machine shut down completely and it would never operate again. They couldn't repair it. So they had to replace that machine. <laughs> Anger. The curse. It is. <laughs> if, right? If it is. And also think of that, and this has happened to me, where you're working, say, on a computer or you're trying to maneuver through these websites or whatever. And if you know this, when you get really upset and stressed by it, oh, they're screwing us around, blah, 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 blah it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Like tonight when I was sending the link out for Zoom, I really made certain I checked before I sent out the email to everyone that the link was active. But when I, it came back to me, I saw it, I thought, oh no, it's inactive. And yet it was blue when I sent it out. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to take it directly from Zoom rather than Meetup. And I, I sent it to myself first and I thought, okay, it's active. And then I had to send another email out. And I made certain as I was doing it, that I didn't get flustered because I thought if I got upset or flustered about it, it would make the situation worse. Possibly. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, that's something that's not really in, in our control. Mercury retrograde is just happening. And this is what happens. Technology fails. I mean, uh, I know somebody that's very calm. She's very uh, knowledgeable about technology and uh, very comfortable with it. She doesn't get flustered. Like she's a calm person. And uh, she lost a bunch of files, her, her whole hard drive. The last time Mercury went retrograde, you know, there's stuff that's happening out there in the ethers and the planetary alignments that we can't really control either. Yes, but we can control how we respond to it. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with that. <laughs>